Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to present our paper, Climate Stress Testing. And this is joint work with Rob Engel and Dick Berner from NYU Stern. And the standard disclaimer applies the views here are the authors, not the neurofeds or the feds. Okay, so understanding the impact of climate change on financial stability is a very important question for researchers, banks, and regulators alike. And how could climate related shocks impose systemic risk on financial sector if banks systemically suffer huge losses following a sharp increase in either transition risk or physical risk? then climate change can affect financial stability. And the transition risks come from changes in policies as economies move into less carbon intensive environments and physical risks come from damage to property following extreme weather events or long term changes in climate patterns. And one of the key questions here is about quantification. So how much systemic risk does climate change impose on financial sector? That's the research question of our paper. So in our paper, we develop a climate stress testing methodology to test the resilience of financial institutions to climate related risks. And our methodology is market based and it involves three steps. The first step is to measure the climate risk factor. And then the second step is to estimate time varying climate data of banks. And the climate data will measure the exposure, each bank's exposure to the climate risk factor that we measured in the first step. And then the last step is to compute the systemic climate risk based on the climate data that we estimated in the second step. And we are going to call systemic climate risk C risk. And the C risk is the ex expected capital shortfall of banks in a climate stress scenario. And we apply this methodology to large global banks to understand their climate related risk exposure. And here are the key findings. First, we find that the climate data and sea risk went up substantially during 2020. The aggregate sea risk of the top four U.S. banks went up by $360 billion, and that's about 40% of equity market cap. And we decompose the increase into the three components. And based on the decomposition analysis, we find that the increase in C-risk during 2020 was primarily due to decrease in equity values as opposed to debt deterioration or increase in risk. And because this could mean that the banks were already under stress in 2020 without any climate stress, so that led to our next analysis which is comparing the C-risk with the non-stress C-risk, where the non-stress C-risk is the capital shortfall of banks under no climate stress. And we find that the difference between the C-risk and non-C-risk of the top four U.S. banks was $245 billion. So this means that the effect of the climate stress was actually substantial. And lastly, um, we find that the banks with higher exposure to gas and oil loans have higher climate beta and C risk. So this adds the economic validity of our measure. So let me now explain each step of our methodology in detail. So the first step is measuring the climate risk factor. There can be many ways to do it, but we use market-based one. So we use Litterman's stranded asset portfolio return as a measure of transition risk. The stranded asset portfolio is composed of 30% long position in energy ETF and 70% long position in coal ETF, and it's normalized by S&P 500 index. And what you see here is the cumulative return on the stranded asset portfolio and you can see that it has been falling one week since 2011. 
And for the time period when the core ETF was not available, we used the average return of the top four coal companies, which is the gray line here and also here. And we interpret this underperformance of the oil and gas sector as a rise in transition risk. So once we have the climate factor, then we estimate each bank's climate beta. And the climate beta is bank stock return sensitivity to the climate factor that we just estimated in the first step. And we use two factor model for bank stock return. The first factor is market factor, and the second factor is the climate factor. And the loading on the second factor is what we are interested in, and we call this climate beta. And we estimate this dynamically, so we allow for volatility and correlation to be time varying, and we estimate this on daily basis. And in general, we expect to see positive climate beta for large banks because they have large exposure to gas and oil loans. But it's also possible to see negative betas if banks have large exposure to renewable energy sector, for instance. And here are the climate betas of the top 10 US banks. And first of all, you can see that climate betas move around. So it's, it means that it's important to estimate this dynamically. And the climate beta started off from zero in the early 2000s, and then it fell into slightly negative territory here in the beginning of the financial crisis. And it has been rising and the spike in 2020 was quite substantial. And um, when I looked into the climate change related events, it does not always respond to every single climate change related event. But we see that after the Paris Agreement, we can see that climate beta are moving up a little bit. And after the Trump withdrawing from Paris Agreement, we can see that the climate beta are falling somewhat here. In any case, um, I want to emphasize that there was the spike during 2020 when the energy prices collapsed. And this was common for other countries as well. So this. These are the climate beta of UK banks. They are on average somewhat higher, but um, we find similar pattern. The slightly negative, I mean, negative climate beta here and um, high, um, the substantial increase in climate beta in 2020. That was same for Canadian banks and Japanese banks, as well as the French banks. And once we have the climate beta, then we can now compute the C risk. And here we follow the S risk systemic risk methodology. And the C risk is defined as the expected capital shortfall conditional on climate stress. And it depends on D, which is the book value of debt, and W, which is the market cap of the bank. And then the long run marginal expected shortfall, which is the expected equity loss conditional on the climate stress. And in this term, um, we have the climate beta that we estimated in the previous step. And we set this K, which is the prudential level of equity relative to assets to be 8% for um, all countries other than European ones. And we use 5.5% for European banks to account for accounting differences. And theta is the climate stress level, and we calibrate it to 50% because the negative 50% is the 1% quantile of the six month return on the stranded asset portfolio. So the climate stress scenario that we are considering is the 50% down in the stranded asset portfolio over a six month time period. So this is our C-risk computation methodology. And here are the C-risk of the US banks. So first of all, the positive numbers mean that this, there was a capital shortfall, expected capital shortfall under, under climate stress. 
a negative numbers can be interpreted as excess reserves. And um, because the C risk is not solely determined by the climate beta, a bank with high climate beta in the earlier plot may have low C risk if the bank is has sufficient equity capital. In any case, you can see that there was a substantial increase in C risk during 2020 last year. And again, this is for the UK banks, and you can see there was an increase here. And again, uh, for Canadian banks, Japanese banks, and French banks, we see this common pattern. So now let's zoom into 2020 and see what happened. So on the left hand side is the C risk of the top 10 US banks. And you can see that at the end of the first quarter, there was a common jump across banks. So, for instance, the screen line is for Citibank. The Citibank's C risk went up from $20 billion to $100 billion. And on the right hand side, um, what I'm showing is the loan amount lent to the gas, gas and oil industry for each bank. And although the rankings do not align perfectly, you can see that they are quite consistent. So on the left hand side, the top four C-risk banks are the Citibank, Wells Fargo Bank of America, and JP Morgan. And those are the top four banks on the right hand side table. And similarly for the UK banks, the top two banks in terms of C-risk were HSBC and Barclays. And again, those are the top two banks on the right hand side table. So this means that um, the banks with large exposure to gas and oil industry have higher C risk. And then we can decompose the increase in C risk into three components. The first component is the contribution of change in debt to the change in C risk. And the second component is the contribution of equity deterioration on the change in C risk. And the last component is the change, the effect coming from the change in volatility or correlation. And um, this is a decomposition table for the US banks. So this column, the first column is the C risk at the end of 2019. And the second column is the C risk at the end of 2020. So the third column is the change during 2020. And the next three columns are the decompositions. And if I add up the four numbers here, change in C risk during 2020, they add up to $364 billion. And about 75% of that is coming from the equity deterioration. And that was similar for the UK banks. The, the aggregate change in C risk um, of these five UK banks was $134 billion. And again, more than 75% is coming from the equity deterioration. So, does this mean that the banks were already under stress in 2020 without any climate stress? So, that's um, that. That question led us to think about this. We compared the C risk with the non stress C risk. And what I'm plotting here is the difference between the two for the top 10 US banks. And you can see that the gap opened up in 2019 and it, the gaps are increasing in 2020. And if I add up the top four banks, um, difference between C risk and non C risk, non stress C risk, they add up to $250 billion. That's a substantial amount coming from the effect of climate stress. And the UK banks, um, they are on average lower, and, but yet still you can see that um, they are rising. And in other countries, um, the gap is widening up as well. And then we compared 
the effect of market stress and the effect of climate stress. So what I'm plotting here are the marginal C risk, marginal S risk in red and marginal C risk in blue for the top four US banks. So the marginal C risk is the difference between the stress and non-stress C risk that you that you um, saw in the previous slide. And you can see that the marginal, so the marginal C risk is capturing the effect of climate stress. Marginal S risk is capturing the effect of market stress. And you can see that the marginal C risk was pretty much zero before 2019. But then in 2020, there was a jump. Um, and then in terms of the magnitude, the marginal C risk is about half of the marginal S risk. And for the UK banks, um, here are the plots and the marginal C risks and S risks are lower. But again, the substantial amount of marginal C risk, um, you can see them here. And they are non-trivial compared to the marginal S risk. And lastly, we um, tested the validity of our measure by comparing the climate data of the banks with the exposure to gas and oil loans. So what you see here on the y-axis is the climate data of the 10 US banks. And on the x-axis, this is the log of the gas and oil, active gas and oil loans at the end of the second quarter last year. You can see that the relationship is positive. And we tested this um, formally in a regression and we find the consistent evidence. So we find that the banks with higher exposure to gas and oil loans have higher climate data. So this adds economic validity of our measure. So to conclude, um, we develop a climate stress testing methodology and we introduce a measure, um, the C-risk measure, which is the expected capital shortfall of financial institutions in a climate stress scenario. And we find that the climate beta and C-risk went up substantially during 2020, and that was primarily due to equity deterioration. And it was not the case that this was because the banks were already under stress in 2020. We find that the effect of climate stress was substantial. And lastly, we find that the banks with higher exposure to gas and oil loans have higher climate beta and C risk as well. And as the next steps, we are considering um, to include more banks, I, I mean, more financial institutions, including insurance sector and asset management sector. And we will also look into more countries. And we are also looking into the um, Fed's internal data, why working data to understand better what how banks are responding to the climate change related shocks. And we are also refining the um, transition risk measure. And hopefully we want to include the physical risk into our framework in the future as well. So we hope this could be a useful complement to the other climate stress testing methodologies and also scenario based analysis. Thank you.